So today we're closing a community exploration of the futures of wise cities, and our speakers are going to peel back some of the layers on making and living in urban spaces and to help us make sense of them today. We have Carl Magnus Olson, who is a professor of computer science and director of external relations at the Internet of Things and People department at Malmö University. He's going to talk to us about trustworthy data points and accountable machine intelligences. Inna um, Zrajagiewo, I gave it my best effort, a service designer and participatory expert for Drevet and co-founder of the initiative Feral Malmo, whose article in a design journal with, uh, was a reference for this topic. We'll share more on the relationships between human and nature. And then to close us out, Finn Williams, who's the city architect of Malmo and named as one of the most influential individuals in architecture and design in Sweden in 2023, will talk to us about this relationship between past, present, and future layers of our urban palimpsests. We'll leave 20 minutes at the end of the presentations uh, for questions for you, of which I'm sure you'll have many. And so now we'll get to this discussion. And Carl, I hand it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Is the volume fine for everyone? Yep, good in the back. Um, so, um, thank you, Hildred, for that introduction as well. I don't have anything to add to that, but I can add that even after the 20-minute Q&A, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. I really do like getting questions and invitations for all kinds of events. So, let's start by recognizing that when you work in this space, which is smart or wise cities, as we are talking about here, there are so many different definitions or views, some of them strong, uh, for what actually this is. And there are easily as many definitions as there are people working in the area, I would say. So I don't think that's something that should be approached as a problem. I think this is a natural thing because A, the area is emerging, so we're still not quite sure what the suit really looks like. But B, we also need different definitions, different viewpoints, because people come from different perspectives and have different interests as well. Uh, an example from architecture, I have a background in architecture, both physical buildings and software. So if you are talking to an electrician, you want to make sure that they have a really good understanding of their perspective and that being highlighted on the, on the actual plans, but also still keep some of the layers that are relevant for the context that they will be doing their work in. So smart cities or waste cities are very much the same. So being clear with where you're coming from is a good idea. Um, every city has their own approach. This is rooted in, of course, the strengths and the specifics relevant for that city. Building on your strengths are always a good idea when you're working with organizational change or societal change. But that also means we start at different points. This does not mean you shouldn't anymore look at other examples. Quite the opposite, I would say. Look at many other examples and discuss them and consider sort of what are the pros and cons from your context. And one of the examples I tend to return to often myself is the city of Nice in southern France. I have many reasons for liking Nice, but I also think they are doing some very good work when it comes to uh, smart cities. And they started as late as 2010, really, but have in a fairly short period of time uh, been established both within France as the leading city and region when it comes to smart city, both solutions and competence, so new talent coming out of the education system. Uh, a lot of their projects are highly focused on uh, participant engagement. So there's a lot of, I mean, this is a cultural thing in France, if you know France, everyone tends to get behind and sometimes against um, societal change. So understanding this was, why they also chose to emphasize sort of uh, co-design uh, and these kind of more participatory elements that we will hear a little bit more later on. Um, but I think this, this city and their approach has been very good. And one of the parts that I really like is how quickly they also set up um, 
sort of an experiment, uh, experimentation environment for various initiatives. So there is a level of tolerance for doing exploratory work. Some doesn't work, so don't expect everything right away to pan off, learn from your lessons. And I also think that they, they emphasize sort of the business perspective. A lot of new companies were coming out of this system. And one of the projects that I also recommend that you read up on if you're curious, a current project is the EU-funded IRIS Smart Cities project, where they work on a number of different areas, but within four districts in this region, one of which is, for instance, the the IKEA showroom that they have down there is one part of this where it's actually in the Sport Valley district where they are doing quite specific work with different commercial actors uh, to really highlight uh, their unique perspectives on and their unique interests in how to contribute to this better society. Um, Going back to Malmö, one of the initiatives that are is very recent, so we don't know yet how it's really panning out. The decision, the green light was given April 12th, is the Malmö Startup District. I'm not going to talk that much about it, but I think this is an interesting example that is similar to the type of setup that they had very early in NIS. Hopefully we can build on this as well as the many other initiatives in the region to create the same type of living labs and experimentation in society over time, ideally. And one of the unique aspects of Malmö is that there are quite a few, and I would say probably more SMEs involved in the commercial space here than there are in most other countries. And in their report before they greenlighted the, the initiative, it was also pointed out that Malmö is actually, even in comparison with all the other major uh, regions in Sweden, still the the most most growth um, sustain uh, the most the area that had most most sustained growth in their small companies. Looking specifically at some of the known challenges that they identified, the top four are all competence relevant or related. And I think this is this is an important issue to address because I honestly don't think we will have a good chance unless we can address the competence, both in terms of expertise, but also in terms of shared understandings for what is possible, what is feasible. That takes some patience. So we also need to work with the competence questions over some time. I know that Media Evolution have their uh, co-skill project is one example. We also, as a university, of course, have various adapted courses for professionals. We have a larger initiative both on the university level as a whole, but also within my own department, computer science. And of course, my perspective and our perspective is heavily influenced by the sort of beast that AI has become as of late. So. We really are emphasizing, we have, for instance, we are starting a course this fall that is AI for Society. It's directed specifically at people that have very little technical background and just want to understand what, what is this really about so we can talk about it on a more specific level. So those kind of initiatives are really important. And it's not only important to establish understanding here, but also to make it attractive for people that have the expertise to come here because here is an area where you can actually get a chance to talk more specifically about or work more specifically about in the more technical areas. One of the pro projects that we are a part of and that this event is part of is the also EU funded Digital Hub Sweden that was just mentioned. Within this project, we, together with the 30 ish partners, are working on to support the public sector as well as the manufacturing industry, the SMEs in the manufacturing industry in southern Sweden. And we are looking to help them digitalize. This tends to be focused, and we're expecting the focus to be a little bit more towards those that are sort of getting onto the train. 
So uh, some of the support that we are providing as a project includes um, digital maturity assessments, digital ecosystems. We do various short to medium sized projects called digital missions, um, where we also work on sort of reaching this funding opportunity or investment stage as much as possible, because that's a, that's a stage many actually struggle with. We as a university, of course, have a role to play within this that is beyond our other two focuses on education and research. Because we as a university, not just Mame, but every university has a very important sort of public service purpose as well to help society change in a positive direction. Uh, I also want to stress that this project is not just good for those that approach it and need help. It's also good for the region in terms of the partners within the project are also building a lot of capability when it comes to actually supporting the transition to a digitalized society. So, so far, we know good things are happening, but where are we really going? So, one reason, one way to try and answer this is to look a little bit at previous initiatives, and one area within smart cities that is easily one of the hotter topics, especially after the past two winters, is the smart energy area. This is smart grid. And I want to I want to emphasize that the, the visions for this within both academia and industry about 10 years ago was that everything would be connected. We would have uh, smart thermostats, smart lighting, smart appliances in every room. And this would all be connected to a grid to get some sort of uh, robustness, sure, but also to be able to share load for these spikes in energy. Uh, we as consumers were also expected to provide some level of energy production back into the grid, both to reduce our own footprint in terms of energy, but also because sort of pitching in was a good idea. And this, of course, got very controversial this week when the Swedish Energy Inspection Agency kind of threw a spanner in, in this work because they said, oh, by the way, you also need to pay this tax. So congrats for trying to contribute. So at this point, I think you can probably hear from the tone of my voice that I'm not super impressed with the progress that's been made the last decade. I think part of this is because it's a complex thing to change. There's a lot of existing infrastructure out there that isn't easy to change, both in terms of buildings and in terms of actual wires that limit the capacity for changing how to work with smart energy. But I'm, I'm not just complaining because others have done bad things or haven't progressed as much. I also ran a large project with 20 some partners within the region, important players, the key ones, in this area. We fortunately realized perhaps we shouldn't focus only on new buildings. We actually focus instead on how to retrofit existing buildings because those are there are millions of buildings. We can't just tear them down and build new stuff. That's not sustainable at all. So what we tried to do was try to understand what actually works, what can you do. So in order to focus more on sort of what works, we shifted, we pivoted to focus more on the specifics that each household or each office might be able to do, and the understanding of the occupants rather than the smartness of the system. So as you can imagine, this three-year-old project is 
I mean, it, it was a rude awa awakening for a lot of us on the complexity really involved here and how how difficult it is to start measuring stuff, especially on a on a larger scale, because people feel very intruded upon. It was well known at this time that just installing a sensor changes how people think and it changes how people work. We actually had more impact from telling people that we will start monitoring these things. I mean, they were volunteers, so they knew this was going to happen. We had more change from installing the, the, the sensors than actually the services that we provided on top of it. So that says something. Whether or not that's a sustainable and lasting change, I don't know. But what we did learn in this project was that two of our sort of more out there initiatives were actually, I would say, more relevant than the sort of bigger vision we had for, for this project. And one of these was uh, sort of a, a negotiated temperature gauge for a room, actually a classroom, but of this size, where people would essentially be able to comment on the air quality and the temperature and so on and so forth, and perhaps reach uh, some sort of agreement on what works and what doesn't work. That idea in itself was, importantly, connected to tangible benefits that the students would work towards. This would include, it could include stuff like how uh, the reduction in energy costs, how, how close are you to a new basketball hoop, or how close are you to a second teacher, or something like that. That also created a lot of discussion between the different students as well as the teachers on what are the tangible benefits that we want to provide from this because and our our sort of analyze or analysis of this is it's the the reasons for doing smart energy solutions is it needs to be tangible the the belief in oh it's good for society i mean that's that's nice and all but people want something concrete. Otherwise, it's a little bit like telling your children to eat more salad. It's good for you, I promise, but all they really want is ice cream and candy. So the tangibility of the reward was very important. In our other example, we, we combined, we actually developed a Flappy Birds clone. It's a computer game at the time that was super simple. Uh, we integrated that with a building management system at a school in Klagsand. So that the game would get harder if there were energy thieves in the building. So half of the class essentially ran off and tried to find these energy thieves that they believed contributed to um, sort of making the game harder, sure, but also was, had a negative effect in terms of energy consumption. And then the other half, they spent time playing the game. And we, we actually were amazed at how quickly these, I mean, they were third graders, how quickly they picked up a lot of the understanding for building dynamics and these kind of heating systems that honestly, it took me some advanced courses on university level to start really understanding what they were doing. And they adapted very well to sort of the type of weather it was outside and the climate. And how quickly these systems, or how slow actually, these systems are in responding to change. So this was a very engaging project to them. There is a really good paper by Yolanda Strengers from Melbourne. Um, it's good in the sense that it's provocative and it's on the po to the point. She argues that a lot of the smart energy solutions for everyday life are, they're actually designed for some sort of superhuman resource man kind of figure. And yes, it's a man, not necessarily because in practice the person that uses these solutions, these apps usually, is a man, but because the both the engineering and the economic side of solutions for smart energy, they tend to be dominated by men. 
the the problem she saw was that this superhuman person was assumed to be always interested, always focused on being running these sort of experiments at their own houses or in their own environments to better understand and optimize really the the way the buildings work, the way that they adapt to changes in the environment, the number of people in the room and so on. But real everyday life in families doesn't work that way. In the past winter, for instance, I suspect many of you have experiences where even within a single household, potentially not even with children, there's some level of disagreement on how to actually work or what, what is useful energy consumption. What do you, how much do you want, are you willing to impact your own quality of life or expectations? So the question of energy isn't really one about optimization. It's one about negotiation. It's about getting people that are in the space to come to some sort of mutual agreement, despite likely having quite different viewpoints on what they are after. So she argues for re rethinking this approach. And I mean, for us as a project, we were we were happy to see that someone else had similar experiences. And my two examples that I just took, they are examples where perhaps not the resource man was our target. We should have really targeted people having something to share a discussion around. And perhaps money isn't the ultimate measurement. Of course, optimization is still important. We do a lot of research on that, but it's not important if your target is households or families, probably not even if it's office spaces. In another project, also a larger project, we, we toyed, this was on open data and open innovation and included some 20 uh, different uh, partners. And this project, we looked at what can you do in a more playful way? We developed this, uh, this is a free runner game for those that know what that is, but it's essentially using context cues from the environment to entertain people that are sitting on buses, but also make sure the game ends before you need to get off. And this game was incredibly well received and a lot of people actually kept on playing even two years after the project ended. Ironically, we had to stop supplying the game because one of the open APIs that we had promises that it would remain open actually wasn't no anymore open. So these kind of solutions are um, perhaps good ways to not optimize energy consumption, but rather uh, support engagement with an understanding for what kind of data and what kind of systems can you actually interact with within a smart environment. I know that I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to simply end there and hand the word over to Hildreth. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.